Hi, and welcome to this episode where we're going to take a close look at some advanced test and measurement instrumentation, and we'll be looking at how we can take advantage of the latest technology to accelerate the EMC compliance process. And this video is kindly sponsored by Keysight, so we're going to be exercising some of their hardware to demonstrate how it can be used to accelerate the EMC compliance process. We have not one, not two, but three different hands-on demos in this episode. But before we get into all of that, let's zoom out and see how test and measurement equipment fits into the, the many options and areas that we have available to optimize the EMC process. And if you're watching this video, you're probably well aware already of the potentially extreme downsides of failing any EMC tests uh, with all of the costs involved and the delays to time to market. Uh, so I won't go into that here. We can all accept that it's a great idea to minimize and optimize the process to make EMC really not a problem at all, ideally. Uh, so if we take a very broad look at the design cycle of a hardware product, uh, we'll be able to visualize the various types of solutions and processes that organizations can use at each step of the design cycle. Firstly, at the concept stage, uh, nothing's really set in stone here, of course, so we get to make lots of choices about a design uh, that could potentially help or hinder the EMC process. Everything's on the table here, so from the EMC perspective at least, we want to know which emissions and uh, immunity tests our product will face when it comes to compliance time, and we want to make smart choices with that in mind. For example, if we know our product is going to be facing 200 volts per meter radiated immunity testing uh, for an automotive application, then we should be thinking at the concept stage about materials and shielding and filtering and cabling and how we're going to deal with that large amount of received radiated energy. Similarly, it's useful to know what kind of radiated emissions limits your product must achieve because that's going to dictate the effort required for EMI control measures. So for example, if the radiated emissions limit isn't very stringent, such as for a class A digital device, then maybe we can get away with fewer layers on our circuit boards, or maybe we don't need quite as elaborate uh, a power filter. And probably the only way to mitigate potential EMC or EMI issues introduced at the conceptualization phase is really through training and experience uh, so that you can hopefully foresee the, the types of issues and certain high level design choices um, that can influence EMI performance. And without being able to foresee how certain high level choices about a product may impact EMC performance, uh, then you may run into trouble later in the design process once the you know, overall concept has been ironed out. Now when the rubber hits the road and we get to the design stage, we fortunately have uh, quite a few tools at our disposal. The first and probably the most important is to have experienced staff on hand who have a pretty good idea of how some major design decisions can impact the overall EMC performance of a product. Uh, they'll be thinking of things like uh, am I accidentally creating a dipole antenna structure by placing connectors at opposite sides of a circuit board? Or uh, what kind of data interface am I going to choose for a certain function? Am I going to choose a simple single-ended interface that's potentially cheaper to implement uh, but may cause me major headaches? for radiated emissions or radiated immunity testing? Or am I gonna choose a differential mode interface with high common mode uh, rejection ratio that's much more robust in terms of uh, rejecting radiated and conducted disturbances? Um, but in the absence of a, a very senior engineer who's been through this loop uh, multiple times, uh, training courses are a good way to provide a, a shortcut to foreseeing the, the potential impacts of certain design choices. Uh, and there's no shortage of those around. Um, and it, it can also provide some foresight for uh, contingency plans, like perhaps I want to leave more space in, in this area of the product in case I need a much uh, higher performance filter and things like that. Now, another resource we can use at this stage of the design process, once we have uh, a draft version of the schematics and layout, is that we can begin to do some EMC design rule checking 
Um, and that can either be a, a manual process, uh, just like you would uh, do a schematic review or a layout review. And uh, a number of engineers can collaborate and review the design against um, many well-known industry standard best practices when it comes to EMC and EMI design. There are also some automated rule checker options that may integrate into your CAD tools, uh, which can potentially help to catch some issues before the circuit boards are actually manufactured. And things that might come up here are things like, uh, you know, it might highlight accidentally crossing a gap in the adjacent reference plane for high speed signals. Uh, or forgetting to drop a via to ground uh, to, to a ground plane as close as possible to, to the ground pad of every decoupling capacitor. And these can all be very useful things to catch at the design stage. And things caught during a design review can, can definitely be useful to, to catch at the design stage and they can definitely save you hours or days of debugging once the, the boards have actually been manufactured. So uh, it's quite a high leverage place to, um, it's quite a high leverage thing to do. And another powerful resource at this stage is to use simulation tools. And of course there's many different types of simulation tools but uh, specific to EMC, we can simulate um, signal integrity, power distribution network performance, as well as time domain and frequency domain field solvers for EMC. And the idea behind all of these is we can uh, simulate the real world behavior before we actually manufacture anything. You know, ideally so that we can avoid some of the expensive problems uh, that are hard to change once physical hardware has been manufactured. Now some folks might say, why does uh, signal integrity and power integrity affect EMC? Why would simulating signal integrity performance help me with EMI? Um, well, the, the three go hand in hand, really. Um, EMC, SI, and PI, because they all affect each other. If we have poor signal integrity where there's a lot of ringing on the edge uh, transitions of our uh, digital comm signals, that can easily translate to excessive radiated emissions. And similarly, if we have imbalanced high-speed differential pairs uh, due to things like in-pair length mismatches or impedance mismatches, um, that can generate enough common mode current very easily uh, to fail radiated emissions testing. And a paper by uh, Bruce Archambault uh, covers this in, in detail. Also, we can use the power integrity simulation tools to, to proactively check whether our decoupling strategy is, is sufficient, uh, because if it isn't, we can accidentally generate a lot of RF noise on our power rails and in the ground planes, um, which can contribute significantly to uh, radiated and conducted emissions problems. So that's where tools like uh, ADS from Keysight um, with integrated signal and power integrity simulation flows and electromagnetic uh, simulations uh, can come in very useful. And so just a quick recap here. At the design stage, this is where we have uh, some of the highest leverage to mitigate EMC or EMI issues by making uh, very informed high level decisions on the design and uh, performing manual or automated EMC design reviews and performing signal integrity, power integrity and uh, EMI simulations. And of course, some of those options may or may not be available to you depending on what type of organization you work for and what kind of financial resources they have available to invest in these types of solutions. And we'll get into that a bit more shortly. Each of these options really offers an opportunity to accelerate the EMC design process. Now, once you have physical hardware in your hands, uh, we get into a whole new ball game. Now we can make actual measurements to see if our simulations produced results that were close to reality. And at this stage, we can, we can start to undertake pre-compliance testing uh, using EMC test equipment, either in-house or at a third-party test lab, uh, depending on what resources you have on hand. And for many manufacturers, uh, they choose to just run the full suite of emissions and immunity uh, compliance tests on their product at this stage uh, so they know where they're standing with, with the prototype units. And of course this costs more, but it can be cost effective if it highlights an issue that is, is still solvable at this stage in the design process. 
and for this video we're, we're going to be focusing on measurement instrumentation and specifically around spectrum analyzers and signal analyzers, EMI receivers for radiated emissions measurements and how the, the specifications of those devices can accelerate compliance in the right circumstances. And those circumstances will be quite different if your company is a very small manufacturing company uh, producing you know, maybe one or two products per year versus say a multinational corporation who are producing many, many products per year and the compliance bottleneck is, is extremely important for maximizing revenue. And as an example, I like to use this table here which shows some of the key resources that a company may have available depending on their size. Uh, so for a startup company or a very small manufacturer, they may not consider EMC requirements uh, up front and they may not do EMC design reviews or simulations or pre-compliance testing and they may not have any emissions or immunity pre-compliance equipment in-house and perhaps their first experience with EMC is when they discover to their dismay that they may not legally be allowed to sell their product until it's been through an authorization procedure. Um, and, and on the other hand, uh, for multinationals, they typically have very well-developed in-house processes uh, where EMC requirements are considered early in the design process and they design their products with EMC in mind and they perform design reviews, simulations, and they definitely do pre-compliance testing and very often they have their own test facility in-house. So those are the main areas for optimization you want to kind of be thinking about at this stage in the design process. Now the production stage, or really at the pre-production stage, where there's perhaps been a small batch run made, uh, this is where the product is typically submitted to a, a third party test lab for full compliance testing. And hopefully if you've prepared during the previous steps, uh, there won't be any surprises here. And regardless of the size of the organization, uh, this step can introduce a delay to the design cycle uh, easily of a few weeks if it isn't done correctly. Uh, and that might be due to things like the avail availability of third party test labs. You know, test labs can have a backlog of weeks, uh, which has a direct impact, of course, on their ability to uh, provide certification testing. Uh, so it's important to, to book ahead and potentially have a backup plan of a different, uh, different test lab in case there's a lack of availability at your first choice lab. Now in terms of uh, instrumentation for compliance testing, uh, that's really what we're gonna be looking at in this video and seeing if there's ways to accelerate the radiated emissions and, and conducted emissions measurements in an environment where there's a large throughput of products. And finally here, uh, one often overlooked area of compliance, especially for um, smaller manufacturers is that of quality assurance and ongoing compliance in, in the field. And for quality assurance or QA, of course, we're going to see some batch to batch variations in EMC or EMI performance, uh, which to a certain extent is factored into the regulatory limits prescribed by the authorities. Um, but also there could be manufacturing issues that significantly affect the performance of the product in terms of EMI or EMC. So for example, perhaps a shielding gasket is not fitted correctly uh, and therefore radiated emissions could be very different than when they were measured at a, a compliance test lab. And it'd be very useful to know that uh, these kind of units are going out into the field. Or potentially maybe there's been a, a part substitution in between the time of compliance testing and full production. Uh, so for example, perhaps there was a, a supply chain issue and it was impossible to buy sufficient quantity of a particular part. So you purchased a functionally equivalent part, but perhaps the, the die is, is smaller, um, a smaller technology. And in the new device, the slew rates are faster and therefore the emissions profile could be different. So there's something you're going to, that's something you're, you're going to want to know about to avoid accidentally producing um, non-compliant units. So later in this video, we'll look at some options for testing on, um, on the production line or testing samples from batches to make, to make sure that they're, uh, they continue to be compliant. 
And for this video, we'll be focusing on measurement instruments and specifically analyzers for emissions measurements. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so now since we're gonna focus specifically on how modern analyzers can help to accelerate the EMC process, uh, let's first consider what the goals are for manufacturers when they're aiming to actually pass radiated and conducted emissions testing. So we're gonna look at the top five goals of manufacturers. So firstly, of course, they want to anticipate and solve EMI issues as fast as physically possible and as early in the design cycle as possible. And later, we'll see how time domain scanning accelerates that aspect. Uh, they want to maximize the utilization of assets, including anechoic chambers and chamber time, which, as you know, can be extremely expensive. And uh, if we consider, for example, a 10 meter fully compliant semi-anechoic chamber, which may be a, a one and a half to two and a half million dollar investment, um, to extract the highest ROI out of that chamber purchase, manufacturers are gonna to want to make sure that all of the work in pre-compliance testing and EMI debugging and final compliance testing in the chamber is as efficient as possible. So if swapping out a single measurement instrument with a time domain instrument, if that can speed up a scan by an order of magnitude or two, that means that the ROI of the chamber asset can be much, much greater. And of course, this has many uh, good knock-on effects, such as clearing testing backlogs, uh, minimizing the amount of waiting time for test schedules, and basically uh, accelerating the overall compliance process. So uh, essentially makes everyone happy. Uh, the third goal is that manufacturers want to be able to make not only rapid measurements, but also repeatable measurements. And repeatability is an extremely important aspect for radiated and conducted emissions measurements uh, so that results, of course, can be compared accurately to the limit lines, um, as well as be able to make measurement comparisons between uh, product configurations of the same configuration at different test sites. And one of the main standards that deals with measurement uncertainties is CISPR 16-4-2. And in that document, there's a table that outlines all of the various contributors to measurement uncertainty during uh, radiated emissions testing. Now, the measurement site itself is the largest contributor coming in at plus or minus 4 dB. Uh, that's the maximum allowable site deviation, which is quantified during the NSA or Normalized Site Attenuation Survey, uh, which is required for any anechoic chamber or open area test site that, that's going to be doing compliant measurements. So the FCC, for example, has a requirement uh, that this site deviation figure needs to be within plus or minus uh, 4 dB at the absolute worst case. And you can see some other contributors here from things like antenna factors and antenna mismatch, as well as these factors here, which relate to the measurement instrument itself, which is the EMI receiver or uh, analyzer. So of the overall uncertainty budget, a fully compliant EMI receiver must contribute no less than plus or minus a couple of dB of uncertainty. And this is something that manufacturers have to quantify to be able to determine whether their instrument is uh, CISPR compliant and to be able to uh, claim that. And that very much depends on the internal architecture. Uh, and as we'll see shortly, it ne necessitates a pre-selector and also very accurately defined filters and de detectors, which we'll take a look at in just a short while. So number four, another goal of manufacturers is that they want to be able to test various configurations of their products and they want to be able to compare the emissions profiles of all of those configurations and they want to be able to do that as quickly as physically possible, of course. And as we'll see in a demo coming up, uh, using a basic spectrum analyzer can take a very long time and you may not get the full picture of the emissions profile to compare between configurations. Uh, so when we're looking at measurement instruments, we want to be thinking about how the instrument can be used uh, to test various configurations quickly and to compare between those configurations. And this is probably more of an issue for complex products with uh, perhaps motors or lots of different sub-modules within the product where there can be many moving parts or different emission sources that can be toggled on and off. 
and many different modes that can be uh, that can independently affect the radiated emissions profile. And perhaps some examples that come to mind are automotive products or medical products where there can be many moving parts and the ability to test various configurations uh, quickly becomes very important. The fifth goal, the final thing I'll mention here is that manufacturers usually want to keep an eye on variations in emissions performance between batches of production units. So rather than just do one compliance test and assume that um, you know, all future products are compliant, uh, many manufacturers double check with a sample of production units, uh, say on a per batch basis or on a monthly basis to, to double check whether there's been any change or degradation in emissions performance. So some things can slip through the cracks um, during production, things like you know, substituting ICs with an equivalent part if there's a shortage, um, that those those new parts may functionally perform exactly the same, uh, but they may have a very different emissions profile. Perhaps the dye was shrunk inside the uh, inside the IC and they switch faster and they have a different profile. So so you have to watch out for that kind of thing. Another thing I've seen come up is if a product has an RF gasket, uh, the performance of that gasket can very much depend on the repeatability of a production line process. So perhaps some screws weren't tightened completely or the gasket was misaligned a little bit. Um, so both of those scenarios could lead to an increase in radiated emissions. Uh, so it's definitely worthwhile testing some sample units between batches on the production line uh, to make sure that there haven't been any uh, degradations or changes. So for that case, it's gonna be very beneficial to be able to do fully compliant radiated emissions measurements very quickly on a sample basis. And again, we're gonna be looking at that later in the video. But before we dive into the use of cutting edge, uh, real-time time domain receivers for EMI measurements, uh, I thought it would be fun to look back at how measurement technology has, has progressed from way back in the day uh, so that we can see how we got to where we are today in terms of the technology. So microwave spectrum analysis actually found its first major application in World War II in the 1940s, and specifically in the design of radar oscillators and radar receivers. So there was a, a new instrument called a spectrum analyzer, which was developed to view the uh, frequency spectrum of a burst of RF associated with the radar pulses in order to, to visualize the returning radar pulses that bounced off enemy aircraft. The instrument also helped in the development and troubleshooting of the radar pulse generating equipment. And since then, spectrum analysis has obviously gone on to find lots of new applications. Uh, for measuring and quantifying many characteristics of oscillating signals from extremely low frequencies now up into the hundreds of gigahertz or um, you know even but beyond. The very first analyzers were little more than RF indicators which lacked calibration and didn't cover a very wide bandwidth. Now jumping forward a bit, this uh, 8551 was HP's first uh, microwave spectrum analyzer and it was introduced in the 1960s. It expanded the state of the art significantly by covering a very wide range of frequencies from 10 megacycles or megahertz to 10 gigacycles, uh, gigahertz, uh, from one coaxial input or all the way up to 40 gigahertz with external waveguide mixers and adapters. And it also had a dynamic range of 60 dB, which at the time was quite amazing. And in the 70s, we started to see the release of a new generation of spectrum analyzers with microprocessor control. Some of you may remember the 8568 and 8566 analyzers, which became indispensable workhorses in the first EMC test houses uh, that began to test the new computer hardware that was being developed and released at the time uh, by manufacturers such as IBM and so on. And you might even find some of these still in use today since they were so robust and so many were made that there, you know, there's still lots of spare parts available for these. And for emissions compliance testing, some of you may remember that a separate pre-selector module was required. Uh, 
um, a whole separate box just for pre-selection. And then the quasi peak detection was accomplished using a completely separate unit that would kind of click and clunk as it performed just one single quasi peak measurement, which perhaps took uh, 10 seconds or so. And that was just for one frequency. Now in roughly the same period, the first real-time spectrum analyzers that utilized FFT or fast Fourier transforms uh, performed on a microcomputer were developed and released. And these allowed for equivalent measurements to be made as much as one or two orders of magnitude faster than a standard swept frequency analyzer. But at the time, their bandwidth was much, much lower uh, operating over the frequency range, basically uh, DC up to a few uh, tens of kilohertz only. But since then, uh, many developments and new improvements have been made to provide uh, increased accuracy, higher bandwidth, and, uh, and higher sensitivity, and basically everything's continuously improving. I should also mention that the internal architecture of analyzers has also developed over the years, integrating more and more digital signal processing as analog to digital converters have increased in speed um, and bandwidth. And then FPGAs and ASICs have also increased in speed to allow for much faster and larger uh, computations. So we'll be covering a bit about how these developments have led to real-time EMI receivers with extremely high bandwidth that allows for rapid and compliant measurements. So first I should probably explain what I mean by compliant measurements. Well, specifically I'm referring to compliant as defined by a standard. And one of the most common standards for defining compliant measurement receivers is CISPR 16-1-1. Now CISPR 16 is an important series of publications that covers things like test equipment specifications and methods and uncertainties. And these standards are referenced by many other standards because they cover in important background tasks of the main uh, testing standards. And during radiated emissions testing, of course, the specification of a spectrum analyzer or receiver is, is critical to the results that you get during uh, measurements. So CISPR 16-1-1 is referenced, which outlines very clearly what is expected of a receiver in terms of you know, things like input impedances and bandwidth and pulse response and selectivity and intermodulation performance and other very specific specifications like that. And for compliant measurements in accordance with CISPR 16, we're going to need to use a receiver or analyzer that was specifically designed to meet these very precise requirements outlined in CISPR 16.1-1. And as you can see from this table of contents, uh, the specified characteristics of a measuring receiver include many things such as bandwidth and frequency tuning tolerance and spurious responses and many more things like that. And to truly comply with this standard, you need an analyzer that's fully compliant with all of these requirements. And this is one of the main differences between an EMI receiver and a standard uh, spectrum analyzer. An EMI receiver is typically designed specifically to comply with these characteristics um, in CISPR 16-1-1 or other similar standards like MIL standard 461. And you may be tempted to go for a lower cost uh, spectrum analyzer, but if you're looking to make those compliant measurements, then it probably won't actually uh, meet the CISPR 16 requirements and your measurements may be off by uh, several dB compared to compliant measurements at, at the least. And a spectrum analyzer most likely won't have pre-selection, uh, which we'll talk about shortly. And also if the, the spectrum analyzer has a quasi peak detector or a button that says quasi peak detector, it usually doesn't quite meet the required standards either. So most compliance test labs will have a measurement receiver, which has fully compliant detectors and meets all of the other requirements. And if we take a quick closer look at pre-selection before we move on, uh, pre-selection is it's essentially a switchable filter bank that's placed before that first mixer. And the pre-selector, as I mentioned, attenuates known or unknown signals outside of the frequency range of interest uh, before they hit that mixer. It, it essentially lets the analyzer focus just on a small slice of the spectrum uh, 
and it attempts to attenuate everything other than that. And for a regular spectrum analyzer, the whole spectrum is passed to the mixer. So overloading the mixer with a signal that we're not even looking at on the screen is a much higher risk. So for example, perhaps we're looking at 30 megahertz to 100 megahertz on the analyzer screen, but perhaps you have a quite high power, like say a one watt, uh, 2.4 gigahertz uh, emitter, intentional emitter uh, nearby. Well, all of that energy can be picked up by the measurement antenna and uh, fed directly to the first mixer unless there's a pre-selector to filter out that intentional radiated uh, signal. So the purpose of the pre-selector is specifically to avoid overload conditions and to maximize the sensitivity and dynamic range of the receiver. And with or without pre-selection can easily affect measurements by 10 dB or more, uh, depending on the characteristics of the input signal. So it's, it's essential for compliant measurements. For pre-compliant measurements, possibly not such of a big issue, depending on how much accuracy you, you actually want to achieve. Uh, but if you're making compliant measurements or, or want to make measurements as close as possible to compliant measurements, then you're going to need an instrument with, uh, with pre-selection. And one further caution when using a spectrum analyzer to make EMI measurements, uh, as I mentioned briefly, uh, the number of scan points on a spectrum analyzer is, is typically only around you know, 500 or 1000 or you know, in that order of magnitude. And that's split up over whatever span you've selected on your screen. So if you've selected a very wide span on your analyzer, uh, those sample points can be very far apart in terms of frequency. But CISPR 16-1-1 recommends a minimum number of sample points equal to half of the set RBW value. And that could necessitate 20 or 30 separate spans or subranges to be able to make compliant measurements. So if you don't use subranging, then the measurements can be very inaccurate because the analyzer resolution isn't high enough and you may completely miss a signal at a particular frequency. So if you're making compliant measurements with a spectrum analyzer, you absolutely must split the scan up into several subranges to make sure you have adequate resolution. So of course the, the test time is extended uh, significantly to, to accommodate all of these additional spans. And another extremely important thing to get right is selecting the correct bandwidth and detectors for making compliant measurements. So the standards you're using will outline the correct settings to use. And if you don't use the settings they indicate, then the, the measurement could be off by easily several dB um, and it wouldn't be considered to be a compliant measurement. Now, in the case of the FCC and for CISPR 32, for example, uh, for measurements below a gigahertz, uh, the six highest emissions must be measured using a quasi-peak detector, uh, specifically with an RBW set to 120 kilohertz. You can use a peak detector instead, uh, which can help to save a lot of test times, uh, but peak readings are always higher than uh, quasi-peak readings because the peak detector does not uh, discharge over time if the signal you're observing, it, even if the signal you're observing is pulsed or intermittent. Uh, so sometimes what labs will do is to measure everything below a gigahertz with a peak detector, and if everything passes, then there's no, no need to use a QP detector. But if any peaks exceed the limit lines, then you can go back and measure those with a QP detector. So sometimes what labs will do during uh, pre-scans is to, to measure everything below a gigahertz with a peak detector. And if everything passes, then really there's no urgent need to use a QP detector. But if any peaks exceed the limit lines, uh, then you can go back and measure those with a QP detector and see if that brings the peak down. Uh, often a, a QP detector will reduce the peak by 3 to 6 dB uh, if the signal is, is pulsed and, and not continuous. Uh, so it can, it can be significant and it can easily make the difference between a pass and a fail. Now above a gigahertz, the, the mandated detector is, is averaging. Uh, the RBW needs to be set to 1 megahertz and the video bandwidth should be set to 10 hertz.
which has the effect of really smoothing things out. And also peak limits apply above a gigahertz and the peak limit is 20 dB above the average limit. And a device must pass both uh, peak and average limits above a gigahertz to be considered compliant. And I should mention here, I'm talking about unintentional emitting devices, so uh, not intentional radiators. Now, because CISPR 16 very clearly describes the specifications of the required measurement detectors, including peak, quasi-peak, and averaging, and even if an analyzer has these detectors, they may not be compliant with the CISPR specs. The amplitude of the output of the detectors depends on the characteristics of those detectors and how they respond to characteristics of the, the input signal. Things like charge and discharge time constants are important as to how the detector responds to the, the repetition frequency um, of the pulses or the pulse repetition frequency. Uh, the quasi-peak detector discharges slowly over time uh, when a pulse isn't present. And the more time between pulses, the lower the QP output. And just as a bit of background here, uh, the requirement for a quasi-peak detector actually arose from the recognition that the quality of radio reception or the perception of the quality of radio reception uh, depended on the type of interference that the receiver experienced. And as early as the, the 1920s and the 1930s, it was recognized that whether uh, interference is broadband in nature or narrowband in nature or pulsing or continuous wave, those all made a difference to the effect of the interference on a, on a receiving radio. And the quasi-peak detector is a way to, to discount the effect of a pulsing signal because a low frequency pulse signal is perceived as having a lower disturbing effect than an equivalent continuous wave signal. And that's why a pulse signal measured with a quasi-peak detector will produce a lower signal amplitude on the output of the detector. And um, that difference between the peak, peak measurement and the quasi-peak measurement may be the difference between a pass or a fail for a product at a, at a test lab. Now the peak detector maintains the peak amplitude of the pulses, uh, just as it would on an oscilloscope. And the average detector provides a much lower RMS average measurement. And again, the detectors you'll need to use will be defined in the measurement standard that you're using. But typically the QP detector is used for compliant measurements below a gigahertz. And as you can see from this table, uh, QP readings are typically anywhere between 0 dB and minus 6 dB below the peak reading. And that delta is governed again by how repetitive the, the signal is at that frequency. And lastly, another of the main characteristics we, we might want to consider when we're choosing an analyzer is that of the displayed average noise level or DANL. And we want this to be as low as possible so that we can measure as small amplitude signals as possible. And so this is basically set by the noise levels internal to the analyzer hardware. The lower the noise in the design, the lower the uh, displayed average noise level, level or DANL. And in this plot, you can see that the ambient level is very close to the limit line in this frequency range. And one of the main factors that affects this margin is the DANL of the receiver. If the standard that applies to your product has low limit lines like this, then the DANL becomes extremely important. Now, another example in these two plots, it shows the same product measured at two separate labs. On the left, all we're seeing is the ambient noise floor of, of the full measurement across the full band. Um, whereas on the right, the noise floor is actually 15 to 20 dB lower um, which actually exposed a very, very weak emission from a product. Um, so, you know, same product, two test labs. The one on the right, the test lab has a much, much lower noise floor and that exposed uh, this, this very weak signal. Uh, so that's why it's sometimes important to have a low uh, DANL. And I'm showing three example specs here from a Keysight Field Fox, also a CXA, and a PXE. And as you can see, this value can vary significantly. For the field fox, uh, 
The slightly higher noise floor has uh, never actually been a problem for me because I use it mainly uh, with near field probes or with uh, pre-compliance test equipment like TAM cells or current probes or whatnot. But if you're performing compliance measurements where the limit lines are extremely low, or if you need to uh, measure very low signal amplitudes, uh, then the DANL uh, spec is something to pay attention to. Now with that kind of background information in hand, uh, let's take a look at this EMI receiver from Keysight. And this is a high performance EMI receiver and also a diagnostic signal analyzer. Um, and it's built on an upgradable platform. Uh, it has a maximum real time bandwidth of 350 megahertz and an ultra low uh, display average noise level of minus 174 dBm. And the frequency range of this particular model is one hertz all the way up to 44 gigahertz. It's designed to perform fast and accurate EMI standard compliance tests, and it comes equipped with an RF pre-selector and EMI bandwidths and detectors, allowing for fully compliant measurements according to several standards, including uh, CISPR 16-1-1 uh, 2019 version, uh, MIL standard 461G, ANSI 63.2, and the FCC amongst many others, including automotive standards and aerospace and uh, many more. And it can be used for EMC certification testing. It would be typically used by hardware manufacturers with in-house radiated emissions testing capabilities uh, and also independent compliance testing labs. But the flexible architecture allows for uh, different operational modes where it can behave like a, a standard spectrum analyzer or a traditional stepped frequency domain EMI receiver or as a time domain scanning receiver. And I don't know the exact price on this model, uh, but I can guess, hazard a guess, that it's well into the six figures. And if you have an in-house compliance lab with a three meter, a five meter, or 10 meter chamber, or for commercial compliance testing labs, uh, this is kind of a top of the line instrument. So, uh, so let's take a look at what it can actually do. Now, the main difference of this model from traditional EMI receivers is the advanced time domain scan feature or the TDS feature, uh, which significantly reduces test time for making compliant measurements and also for viewing a very wide bandwidth at one time and in real time, which can be great for troubleshooting or pre-compliance testing to understand how the emissions from a product vary over time or across functional modes. It can simultaneously display frequency domain scans and real-time peak, quasi-peak, and average detector amplitudes, along with a time domain spectrogram, which together provide a very full picture of the characteristics of the emissions from a device under test. And in terms of applications for this unit, its main benefits are in its ability to accelerate compliance testing and accelerate debugging work and accelerate uh, pre-compliance testing. And given the cost, it would mainly be used by larger manufacturers with in-house test facilities and as well as commercial test labs that want to uh, satisfy customers who want the absolute fastest way to, uh, to complete testing. And we'll be looking at a few examples of this unit in action. And before we check out the architecture of this instrument that allows it to perform so quickly, uh, let's just look at the results. Here I'm going to compare the various modes of the instrument, which will highlight how the speed is so much higher uh, with the advanced time domain scanning mode compared to the regular spectrum analyzer and EMI receiver modes. So here I've set the instrument to behave as a traditional spectrum analyzer first. Uh, it's performing a sweep over the frequency range 30 meg up to 300 megahertz, which is a very common band for radiated emissions issues. There's lots of noise here because what I'm doing is I'm feeding in a signal directly from a swept tracking generator. Uh, so essentially there's a comb generator style output with narrow band emissions across a very broad range of frequencies. The source is the tracking generator output of this FieldFox Spectrum Analyzer. Uh, 
and the spacing between the frequencies it's outputting is about 250 kilohertz. And it's only outputting each frequency for about one millisecond before moving on to the next frequency. And at each frequency, the on time is approximately a millisecond and the off time is in the order of 100 milliseconds or so. Uh, so the tracking generator output is, is producing a, a comb generator output, uh, but every frequency only has a duty cycle of, you know, 1% or, or less. Um, so this type of signal is extremely hard for an analyzer to pick up because we have lots of emissions and all of the emissions we're looking at are intermittent with a duty cycle of less than 1%. So here in spectrum analyzer mode, the sweep rate is set to auto, uh, which is giving a very fast sweep time of three milliseconds. And it's only sampling at a thousand points between uh, 30 megahertz and 300 megahertz. So we're definitely missing a lot of the noise on the screen because it's only dwelling on each frequency for a few microseconds before moving on to the next frequency and the sampling isn't coinciding with the 1% on time of the tracking generator um, frequency output. So we're losing a lot of information. So next I'm gonna increase the sweep time up to a second and then to 10 seconds so that the analyzer dwells on each frequency for much longer. And then we start to see a little bit better picture of the overall noise profile. But again, we're still missing lots of information. And do keep in mind here, we're only viewing the peak signal. So we're not viewing the quasi peak or average data. Um, so this is going a lot faster than it would if we needed to, to view those quasi peak and, and average readings as well, uh, which below one gigahertz you, you do. Um, so in spectrum analyzer mode, uh, by slowing down the sweep time, we can see more of the intermittent emissions across the band. But we're still missing a lot of information and notice that we can't see the band in real time and we're certainly not making compliant measurements at this point. And imagine, because this isn't in real time, if we were rotating the turntable or adjusting the antenna mast, uh, we're not gonna be able to see how these emissions vary as a function of time um, while that turntable is being moved. Um, they're all peak, so we would have peak hold and the sweep time is taking a long time. So um, we wouldn't be able to see how these vary as a function of time as the, as the table was um, turning. And if we did need to make compliant measurements on each of these peaks, we would need to zoom in on each of them and maximize those signals by rotating the, the turntable and adjusting the height of the mast and then performing quasi-peak measurements um, on, on all of them. So this can take a, an extremely long time in the order of hours. Now, if we switch to EMI receiver mode, the initial scan doesn't look good and that's because the dwell time is far too short. Again, we're missing lots of the low duty cycle interference signals. And to make sure we're visualizing all of the emissions, we wanna make sure that the dwell time is at least three times the period between the pulses. So if we increase the dwell time here, you can see that we're capturing a lot more of the information, uh, but it's going extremely slowly. And in fact, I would need to increase that dwell time much more to capture these uh, very infrequently pulsed signals, which have a, a very slow pulse repetition frequency in the order of a few Hertz. But if I switch over to the accelerated time domain scan mode, uh, the picture of the interference suddenly becomes extremely clear. What we're looking at here is the same signal over the same band from 30 megahertz to 300 megahertz, and we're viewing peak, quasi-peak, and average detector readings simultaneously and in real time. The instrument essentially has the equivalent of thousands of quasi-peak and average detectors implemented digitally, of course, and those detectors are spread over the bandwidth of interest. They're simultaneously applied to the input signal so that you get a real-time view across the whole band. And what we're seeing here, the yellow trace is the peak detector, uh, 
And you can actually see that the tracking generator output is sweeping across all of the separate frequencies. And we couldn't see that behavior at all in the other modes. So that's, that would be interesting uh, for troubleshooting and pre-compliance testing purposes to help us understand how that interference is being generated and it would definitely give us clues about where it's coming from. Uh, the purple trace is, is average and the blue trace is the Quasi Peak detector. And another thing that's neat here is that we can turn on uh, time domain visualization, uh, which provides essentially an oscilloscope style visualization at the same time and focused on a defined bandwidth shown here in blue. And this allows you to measure the, the PRF or the pulse repetition frequency and the duty cycle of any signal within that measurement bandwidth or the analysis bandwidth. And this can help you to track down the source of the noise. For example, you may recognize the period between the emissions um, because that may correspond to bursts of data on a bus, for example, or uh, it may correspond to intermittent power supply surges. But it also allows you to see the quasi peak and average amplitudes of the signal in that analysis bandwidth. And we can see here that the quasi peak reading is, is significantly lower than the peak. Uh, because the pulse duration is so short and the duty cycle is quite low. So knowing that the quasi peak reading is significantly below peak is useful because we can determine whether or not that's going to pass uh, the limit lines that we have to pass. And one last thing I'll mention here is how a mode called the waterfall mode uh, can help to highlight intermittent or pulsed signals. So in this example, we have some uh, continuous wave emissions and um, those are visible in the waterfall mode as vertical lines uh, since their amplitudes aren't changing at all over time. Uh, whereas if we look at the intermittent output of the tracking generator again, we have these horizontal lines which are, um, it highlights the short 1% uh, duty cycle emissions across the whole spectrum between 300 megahertz and, uh, sorry, between 30 megahertz and 300 megahertz. Um, so using the waterfall allows us to very effectively check for pulsed signals that can otherwise be completely missed. Uh, we wouldn't be able to see this with a regular EMI receiver or a spectrum analyzer. But just comparing the spectrum analyzer mode to the EMI receiver mode, to the advanced time domain scan mode, uh, you can see how much more information is provided uh, with the TDS mode and how much faster it can make things. So if you apply this technology to a pre-scan or a full compliance scan, uh, let's actually see how much time it, it could save us. So if we take this instrument and use it to measure emissions coming from a product in say a three meter or 10 meter chamber, it can save a ton of time. So let's see how it does that. Now, compliance testing usually consists of two separate procedures, an emissions pre-scan and then a, a final emissions uh, full measurement scan. And the purpose of the pre-scan is to find the worst case emission frequencies from a product and also to determine the uh, worst case scenarios of a product's various functions and modes. So for example, a product may have a number of motors or functions or screens or data interfaces and during a pre-scan, we want to exercise every single function on a product to find the worst case to emissions. And those may be narrow band or broadband. So typically we want power supplies to be loaded to their maximum capabilities and data interfaces to be running at full speed um, and motors to be running continuously if possible. And our goal here as a test engineer, EMC test engineer and as a designer, is to find not only the worst case emissions, but also find scenarios that we perhaps didn't anticipate. And often in test labs to save time, they'll only use uh, peak detection mode in, in the analyzer because it's much faster than when using the quasi peak detector. And during the pre-scan, we'd also aim to find the worst case frequencies and maximize those frequencies by rotating the turntable and adjusting the antenna heights and performing individual quasi peak measurements. Now, according to the pre scan procedure defined in CISPR 16 2 3, uh, a sweep should be made for every 15 degrees of 
turntable rotation. And for both polarizations of the receive antenna, which is horizontal and vertical polarizations. So that's a total of 48 receiver scans over the frequency range of interest, uh, which could be 30 megahertz up to several gigahertz. And also to maximize the worst case emissions, we also need to scan the antenna height up and down. Now in band C and D, which cover the frequency range 30 meg to a gig, uh, the fastest scan rate is dictated by the minimum dwell time. And that minimum dwell time is defined in Annex B of CISPR 16-2-1. Um, at one millisecond per megahertz, that's only a second or so to cover the 30 meg to one gig band. Um, but if you were to use a QP detector um, and a traditional EMI receiver for this whole band, uh, you'd be looking at five hours for, one, for just one scan. So that's why it's normal to, to scan using only the peak detector and then perform the QP measurements only on the worst case emissions. And if there's a suspicion of a pulsed emission, then the dwell time needs to be increased to accurately capture the signal and it should be at least three times the period between the pulses. Uh, so this can increase the measurement time significantly. So we can take easily a few hours to do a decent pre-scan using a frequency-based EMI receiver and test houses will usually suggest at least half a day uh, for a pre-scan to hopefully get a decent idea of the emissions profile from a product. And if four separate antenna positions are required uh, with horizontal and vertical polarizations as well as on the left and right side of the chamber, uh, it can be as much as 36 hours for a comprehensive pre-scan. Now, if everything goes well with the pre-scan, and if the product is essentially finished and ready for final compliance testing, uh, we would move on to the full compliance test. And this would involve maximizing each emission noted during the pre-scan uh, by rotating the turntable and adjusting the mast height until the worst case is found. And as per six, CISPR 16-2-3, uh, the amplitude must be observed to ensure that it's steady. And if it isn't, then it must be monitored for 15 seconds. And if within that 15 seconds, the amplitude varies by more than two decibels, uh, then it has to be monitored for longer. And finally, if the emission is in the band that requires a QP measurement, then this must be done on each of the worst case emissions. But uh, with the, the time domain scanning technology, you can get the quasi peak and peak and average detector readings in real time. Uh, so there's no need to go back and get the QP uh, measurements. So that does save a ton of time. Now, if we look at the equivalent procedure using the, the PXE in time domain scanning mode or TDS or the accelerated time domain scanning mode, um, because we can scan peak, quasi-peak, and average in real time, we don't need to wait for the receiver to, to step through the frequencies at every 15 degree angle of the turntable, like the, the standard says. With the TDS mode, the real-time bandwidth is 59 megahertz. Uh, so technically, we'd need to rotate the turntable several times to take a full scan in each band between 30 meg and a gig. Or with the ATDS mode, where the real-time bandwidth is 350 megahertz, we would only need to make three rotations of the turntable to capture all of the data. And automation software would be able to, to take care of that for us in, in very short order. But essentially with the TDS mode or ATDS mode, as long as you perform a maximization procedure and dwell for a few seconds on each of the worst case emission frequencies, then the pre-scan can actually be the same procedure as the final scan. So the TDS and ATDS modes can save hours and hours and hours of test time. And as we saw earlier, the real-time measurements are especially good at detecting pulsed emissions with low uh, repetition frequencies where they could otherwise be missed by traditional EMI receiver instruments. So, uh, it potentially saves us some extremely large headaches towards the end of a product development cycle. Now, in terms of the internal architecture that allows this advancement in speed, uh, an old school spectrum analyzer will have a block diagram that looks something like this. 
uh, with an input signal hitting an attenuator that hits a mixer, sometimes via occasionally via pre-selector. We have an intermediate frequency gain stage and the resolution bandwidth filters. We have an IF gain stage and the resolution bandwidth filters, envelope detectors, um, video filter bandwidth. And the output of that is displayed on the screen as a sweep generator sweeps a local oscillator frequency from the start frequency uh, to the stop frequency of the measurement. And this is the basic super uh, sweat free frequency architecture that's been around for a long time. And with modern digital analyzers, um, obviously more digitization going on, and this portion of the architecture is, is replaced by an ADC, which converts the analog signal into, into data that can be processed extremely fast um, by ICs on the board. And those ICs can convert the frequency domain signal into the time domain using uh, fast Fourier transforms. And with an RF preselector before the input hits the mixer for down conversion, this is, uh, this is basic simplification of the architecture that you'll find in this uh, PXE unit. But probably the most significant change to the block diagram in this X series instrument is the increased use of digitization and digital filters and FFTs to construct a vector based rather than scalar uh, IF section. And also the huge increase in digitizing bandwidth and processing uh, capacity, that's key to enabling features like vector measurements and digital uh, demodulation. Um, for non-compliance related activities. And so this allows engineers to use this single instrument to cover everything from SWEP to vector to real-time analysis. So rather than needing to purchase two or three different measurement instruments to cover all of these use cases, uh, the X-Series architecture allows engineers to switch between modes depending on what type of measurements they need to, to make and where they are in, in the design cycle and whether they're making EMC measurements or intentional RF uh, measurements as well. Now that uh, 9048B PXE I have here, that uses um, traditional RF preselector filters for the TDS mode, um, and that increases to 350 megahertz bandwidth filters for the uh, ATDS measurements. And it's the IF filters at the output of the mixer that determine the, the maximum bandwidth possible for each FFT acquisition. It also uses high performance A to D converters, which enables high bandwidth digitization uh, for the IF signals. And the PXE's uh, what's called short time fast Fourier transform or STFFT engine uh, can perform frequency domain analysis of up to 16,000 frequency points in a single acquisition to support much wider uh, FFT spans than traditional EMI receivers. So that's the simplified architecture that allows for these ultra high speed real time uh, EMI measurements. Now, if we look at the PXE in, in time domain scanning mode, in particular for uh, compliant EMI measurements, let's look and see what makes it kind of special. Now, time domain scanning using high overlap FFT uh, speeds up the receiver scanning process by simultaneously collecting emissions data across multiple resolution bandwidths. And this method contrasts with frequency domain scanning uh, where the data is collected for each resolution bandwidth separately. The FFT acquisition bandwidth in, in time domain scanning for this PXE are, are 59 megahertz within the frequency range 30 meg to 3.2 gig. Um, and that's in regular TDS mode, or with the latest ATDS or accelerated TDS mode, uh, this bandwidth is increased to 350 megahertz. And this is significantly broader than required by CIS CISPR and MIL standard uh, resolution bandwidths, of course. So in this mode, the receiver gathers data in, in this wider acquisition bandwidth, and it processes it into the necessary regulatory bandwidth. And this process ensures that the measurements all meet um, or meet all of the, the required regulatory standards. And the time savings of this TDS mode comes from its efficiency. Obviously, it applies uh, 
Um, it applies the regulatory dwell time once for all of the data within an FFT acquisition bandwidth. And in contrast, the, the frequency domain scanning means that the receiver needs to dwell for every separate measurement and wait for the detectors to settle, um, which can be time consuming. And it also means that the overall band of interest can't be viewed in, in real time and all at once. To achieve the amplitude accuracy specified in CISPR and MIL standard 461, um, it is necessary for the FFT transforms to overlap. And in the PXC, this overlap is 92%, uh, which ensures that even if there's a narrow band impulse signal, it is spanned by more than one FFT period. And if you didn't have this overlap, then the reported signal amplitude could either be too low, or if it fell right in the middle, it could be missing altogether. And so it's this 92% FFT overlap that allows the uh, PXE to maintain amplitude accuracy, even with uh, impulse signals and to meet the requirements for compliant receivers in, in the relevant standards. Now, zooming out here um, before we move on just for a second, um, because we're talking about so many modes and bandwidths, I wanted to just quickly compare the top level between uh, swept spectrum analyzers, um, step frequency EMI receivers, and then uh, TDS time domain scanning modes specific to these Keysight products and then Keysight's accelerated or ATDS mode. So first, the traditional spectrum analyzer does not usually have pre-selection or compliant QP detection. Therefore, it's only used for pre-compliance measurements using a peak detector. And the sweat frequency architecture means that it's difficult to spot pulsed or non-frequent signals, and you must reduce the span of the analyzer to, to increase and increase the dwell time on each frequency to reduce the chances of missing any narrow band um, and or pulse signals. And this takes a lot of time in the order of hours to do it properly. And these don't provide real-time results, of course, because the frequency is being swept over time and it can take a few seconds or minutes to perform a sweep across a particular bandwidth. Then we have the traditional step frequency EMI receivers. These do have uh, pre-selection, which allows for the instrument to meet um, CISPR amplitude requirements for pulse signals and provide overload protection. Um, they're still slow compared to time domain scans, because they must dwell on each frequency for long enough to, to capture any pulsed or, or intermittent signals. Whereas conventional EMI receivers only measure the signal within the RBW, within the defined measurement time, the Keysight time domain scan simultaneously processes the spectrum up to the maximum bandwidth of the IF filter. And in the Keysight TDS mode for this PXE unit, that's 59 megahertz. And the TDS mode is fully compliant with CISPR 16-1-1 requirements, as well as MIL standard 461G requirements and others. And it also has the ability to calculate and present peak, quasi-peak, and average detector outputs across the measurement band. And this is much faster compared to a traditional stepped receiver, but the challenge is that um, since the, the real-time bandwidth is 59 megahertz, uh, it still necessitates several scans to cover that uh, 30 meg to one gigahertz range where the QP measurements are typically required. And this is why there's a push towards higher and higher IF bandwidths for FFT processing. And so with the ATDS mode, the IF bandwidth is increased to 350 megahertz, which allows for the uh, 30 meg to one gig range to be split up into only three separate spans. Uh, so for each scanning band, the turntable is rotated, you know, 360 degrees and the antenna height is manipulated to find the relevant maxima. Now, according to the PXC specifications, the ATDS mode is fully CISPR and MIL standard 461G compliant down to a pulse repetition frequency of 10 Hertz. So as long as any measured disturbance occurs more than 10 times per second, then the measurement is compliant. 
if there does happen to be a very infrequent pulse with a repetition frequency below 10 hertz, which is quite rare, then the method to accommodate that is to switch back to the standard TDS mode, which is compliant with, with any pulse rate. So those are the main difference between uh, spectrum analyzer, traditional EMI receiver, uh, TDS mode and ATDS modes. Okay, let's move on now to an example of using time domain scanning on a medical product. I have this CPAP machine just for the purposes of this demo. These types of devices are used by people with sleep apnea and it provides um, positive airway pressure as they're sleeping to help patients breathe properly and get enough oxygen during sleep. They're reasonably basic devices that have a controlled fan that generates pressure in this tube and then a mask that the patient wears. And there's also a water reservoir that provides humidity to the air. And medical equipment in general can often have unique challenges with EMI testing uh, since they often have safety critical applications where they absolutely can't fail in response to any electromagnetic uh, disturbances. Uh, picture a, a pacemaker or something like that. And um, many devices, of course, are used in hospitals where there can be particularly high numbers of transmitters and high electromagnetic field um, medical imaging equipment such as MRI or magnetic resonance imaging scanners and, and x-ray machines and things like that. So one of the main EMC standards that applies to medical equipment, that's um, IEC 60601-1-2, um, it has very strict guidelines on the test requirements for medical equipment to ensure that they continue operating sufficiently in an electromagnetic environment that the device will actually be used in. And the EMC compliance is, is just one part of a risk management uh, file that the medical device manufacturer needs to, to establish. And I'll just quickly here give a brief overview of an overall uh, EMC test schedule for an example medical product. And I'll say here quickly, Always check with a, a test lab first because the test levels vary depending on the application and the environment for the product and the overall risk assessment. Uh, so these levels are just an example. Now the first thing is for um, radiated and conducted emissions, the applicable standard is CISPR 11, which cover, covers the limits and method, methods of measurement. Uh, then we have a full suite of immunity test requirements and these tests are applied either to the overall product as a whole or to specific signal or power ports on the product. So first with the enclosure port, almost universally to electronic products that go through immunity testing, whether or not they have any external cabling, they will be subjected to ESD and radiated RF fields. So that's uh, typically the standards uh, 61,000-4-2, and dash three respectively in this case. And the test lab will apply plus or minus eight kV contact discharges all over the chassis of the product, including connectors and up to 16 kV air discharge to uh, certain areas of the product as well. And for this CPAP machine, I found it interesting that the whole machine is actually made of some kind of plastic material. And since it's an insulator, Sometimes ESD discharges can't find uh, any conductive surface to discharge to. So this non-conductive enclosure can be a very good way to protect your device against ESD discharges at the cost of potentially reducing the amount of shielding in the enclosure and that could potentially make it more difficult to pass uh, radiated emissions testing. Now in the case of uh, radiated RF fields, uh, the product's going to be subjected to a radiated field um, in the frequency range 80 meg up to at least 2.7 gigahertz and modulated with a 1 kilohertz sine wave. And the difference here between professional and home environments is the field strength um, 3 volts per meter versus 10 volts per meter, presumably because you can anticipate higher field strengths um, will be encountered in the home environment. Um, but again, this would be subject to a risk assessment and it would be the responsibility of the manufacturer to 
uh, determine the expected electric field strength levels in the environment that it would actually be used in. Another specified test at the enclosure level is also a radiated field test, but this time it focuses on specific bands that are used for common transmitter types like cell phone bands and Wi-Fi, etc. And these bands are covered at higher um, intensities and often with different modulation characteristics to, to better simulate real life. And finally, for the enclosure port, we also have to subject it to magnetic fields at the power line frequencies of 50 hertz or 60 hertz at quite a high field strength of 30 amps per meter. And note this only applies to equipment that does have magnetically sensitive components or circuitry in it. And this could be things like Hall effect sensors or transducers that could perceivably be influenced by low frequency magnetic fields. And the devil's in the details here because uh, the test of 30 amps per meter is only suggested if the equipment will be used further than 15 centimeters away from a source of power frequency magnetic field. If you think it might get closer than that, then you need to outline that in your risk analysis and increase the test level accordingly. Um, so that's uh, the devil's really in the details here. And now for signal input output ports, that would be things like USB, um, communication ports, or uh, analog, um, analog sensor ports. Here's what we have to do. Again, we have ESD, which will be applied to port connectors. And I can't tell you how many failures I've seen from discharges to chassis grounds on connectors. Uh, so that can be quite hard to pass. And on this CPAP machine, again, it's interesting that you can see that the connectors are recessed. And in some cases, if the user can't actually touch a connector with their finger, if they can't actually fit their finger into this hole uh, to touch the connector, then ESD testing of that connector may not be required. So I'm not sure if this manufacturer tried to make this connector inaccessible to a finger, but that feature would possibly help them to pass ESD testing um, because it may not be required in that instance. So it's an interesting design feature. So next we have um, EFT or electrical fast transient according to the standard 61000-4-4. A test level of uh, plus or minus 1 kV is specified and that's applied using a capacitive coupling clamp as opposed to direct coupling. And as is often the case with EFT testing on signal I.O. ports, it's only necessary if the maximum cable length will be over 3 meters. And the reason for that is that the test is to simulate coupling from adjacent cables. And the longer the cables uh, run in parallel, the more disturbance can be coupled into your port. Now surges, according to 61000-4-5, they're applied to I.O. cables at a 2 kV test level, which is a pretty serious level. Uh, but it's only applicable to ports where the cable can run outside of the building, presumably because it's more likely to encounter a near nearby lightning strike outside. And finally, for signal ports, we have conducted RF, which is essentially an injection of common mode current into your port using some kind of transducer like a, a bulk current injection clamp or an inductive clamp or, or some other coupling network. But if we move on and take a look at the remaining tests for the AC and the DC and the patient coupling ports, and I won't spend a huge amount more time on this, uh, you can see the same tests as before apply to AC and DC power ports, only the test levels might be slightly different. And in this case, in the case of the AC power port, you can also see extra tests for voltage dips and interruptions according to uh, 61000-4-11 where we test for disturbances to the input power supply. Uh, obviously, that's, that's an important thing to test for. And the equivalent on DC power ports is the test ISO 7637-2, which only applies if your equipment will be fitted in an ambulance or some other uh, type of vehicle. And finally, we see for patient coupling ports, uh, we need to apply electrostatic discharges and conducted RF immunity uh, tests as well. And if we go back to the CPAP machine, 
I thought it'd be interesting to use the Keysight PXE to, to monitor the emissions coming off this unit. And obviously here, uh, this isn't a compliant test setup. I'm just using a, a broadband biconical uh, antenna in extremely uh, close proximity to, to pick up some of the emissions coming off this product and, and just see what's going on. And you'll notice as I block the, block the airway of the tube and, and then unblock it, if you listen, you'll hear that it affects the fan. There's kind of a surge that happens when the airway is released. And what's interesting, as we monitor the frequency range 30 meg to 300 meg uh, using the ATDS mode, is that we can see an increase in emissions above 250 megahertz or so, uh, and that coincides with the surge of the fan. And that's possibly the power supply increasing the current consumption um, or from the fan motor itself. Um, but also notice that we can see increased emissions at the low end down by 30 megahertz at the same time. Um, just very small variations down there, but that, you know, depending on the test levels, that could mean the difference between a pass or a fail. And we're also viewing quasi peak and average at the same time for this uh, emission at the upper band um, so we can get a very clear picture quickly of the pulse nature of the interference as well as the quantification of the QP measurement so we know whether or not we'll be able to ignore that uh, that emission you know we can tell whether it's going to pass or fail the, um, the the limit lines the QP limit lines as we vary the, the turntable and the, the antenna height and these, uh, these scenarios are really where this kind of time domain scanning can, can help to avoid uh, un unanticipated issues late in the design cycle or at, uh, or at a compliance lab. Um, it's the real time nature of the scan that allows us to see what's happening at any given time. And therefore we get a really clear picture of what's happening across the spectrum as opposed to a swept or step scan which most likely would not be able to pick up this kind of uh, broadband momentary disturbance. Now, in terms of using the instrument for other applications like EMI troubleshooting, uh, let's take a look at an example now and see where this can, can really help us to get to the bottom of some EMI issues. Now, in this uh, next example, I'm using uh, a magnetic near field probe to monitor the RF emissions from this cell phone. And basically this is picking up the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi signals in the unlicensed 2.4 meg band. And I'm using the PXE in ATDS mode and we're looking at the frequency range 2.35 gigahertz up to 2.55 gigahertz, so, so a 200 meg uh, span. So the 350 megahertz real-time bandwidth of this PXE allows us to view this um, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi uh, band in, in real time. And what you'll notice um, using the real-time scan mode is that we can really see what's going on here. Not only can we see the peak and quasi-peak and average amplitudes fluctuating in the frequency domain, but this blue band here, that's where I've set up an analysis band. Um, and in the bottom window, that shows the time domain behavior of that specific band. Um, so we can essentially see like an oscilloscope style uh, time domain visualization of how the RF amplitude is, is fluctuating in that narrow bandwidth. And we can also see a one-time scan operation that the phone does where it scans through a number of channels uh, sequentially. And there's virtually no way that you'd be able to see something like that using a regular um, spectrum analyzer or EMI receiver. Uh, it's really the time domain scanning with FFT that allows us to see these extremely fast, extremely intermittent signals, and that allows us to anticipate potential problems earlier in the design cycle, and that will allow us to solve them before the devices, going, uh, devices go for full compliance testing. So the visibility that this instrument provides to see fluctuations in narrowband and wideband signals with high or low uh, pulse repetition frequencies it's it's pretty incredible all right so that's it for this video i'm just going to wrap it up here with a quick summary uh, we've covered quite a lot of material and a few demos uh, so i just wanted to recap with the key points
Um, so Keysight's advanced time domain EMI receiver allows for real-time visualization of interference across a wide band of frequencies. It allows you to view peak, quasi-peak, and average plots simultaneously and in real time across a bandwidth of up to 350 megahertz. The technology allows manufacturers and test labs to speed up pre-compliance testing and full compliance scans, as well as accelerating the debug process. And if you want uh, more information, head over to the Keysight website and check out the, the PXE product page um, and request more information. But that's it for now, and I'll see you in the next video.